what do you get when you mix fine cuisine with utter simplicity? On today's menu. In Vietnam, subtle and varied flavors are often achieved in the simplest of ways. I love seafood, especially when we come to Ha Long Bay. It's really fresh. An inside look at a remote floating village in the waters of Ha Long Bay. Their sea lakes are so well developed, they often claim to have a hard time balancing on solid ground. A whirlwind tour of Hanoi with a caffeine buzz. We took the French coffee and Vietnamize it <laughs> and make it our own. Rice paper from Tain In that softens in the morning dew. Mrs. Nam is making rice paper for at least 35 years now. The food of kings from Ho Chi Minh City's famous Rex Hotel. We are out here in the middle of Ha Long Bay, one of the most beautiful places in Vietnam, about two hours by boat from the mainland. It's now 4.30 in the morning, and we are going to visit a fishing family of Mr. Nia in the floating village of Va Za. The meal is called Con Tra Ka, sweet and sour fish soup, and it is one of the most popular dishes in all of Vietnam. Originating in the Mekong Delta, it can be found in the finest restaurants of the country. But it is also made in the remote fishing villages of Hao Long Bay, located 100 miles east of Hanoi in the northeast province of Quang Ninh. There are four main fishing villages in Hao Long Bay. And with a population of around 700, Va Za is the largest and one of the most remote. So here we are at the Niat family home. The whole family has lived here for at least three generations. This is Mr. Niat's parents, his wife, daughter, grandchildren, and various in laws. This dish is called Khan Cho Kha. It's a sweet and sour fish soup that is very popular in Vietnam. Of course, a great meal like this has to start with fresh fish. Mr. Nyat wakes up around 4.30 to start fishing at 5 o'clock. He says during the summer season, he usually uses prawns or squid as bait for the fish. At the bottom of the boat, there is a trough of water where he can place the fish to keep them alive. On any given day, he'll catch snapper, groupers, tuna, vok fish, which is a sea bass. He says there aren't as many fish these days because of overfishing. With each passing year, he catches fewer and fewer fish. The weather changes constantly. And then suddenly, the storm is over. These people have lived their entire lives in these floating villages. Their sea lakes are so well developed, they often claim to have a hard time balancing on solid ground. Mr. Niat keeps his fish under the floorboards of his house. If a fish is particularly good, he'll spawn it in special nets to help ensure future fish. This tool she's using is a 50-year-old knife, really old but still useful. The daughter cooks, 
but the whole family contributes on a regular basis, even the grandparents. The grandmother says that before the war, as a fashion statement, the women would dye their teeth black. They thought it looked really cool. The daughter says she uses pork fat to stir fry the tomato. Ingredients like pork, beef, vegetables, fruit, they buy and trade from farmers who come to the village with well stocked boats. After a few minutes, she pours the water in to make a broth. Once the water boils, she smashes the zao fruit to make the flavor sour. And then she adds the fish, a little bit of salt. At the end, she put the spring onion on the top to make it look beautiful. Wow, it's good. It's really yummy. I think it's great. The fish make it sweet, and the zao fruit make it sour, and the soup is just delicious. Halong Bay is a beautiful place. Mr. Nyan loves living here with his whole family. He loves the ocean, he loves the sea. It's just the way it is. The biggest city in the north is Hanoi, which is the capital city of the country. It was first set up in the year 1010. The first king of the Li dynasty in Vietnam, in one of his dreams, saw a dragon soaring up into the sky from this area, and he thinks it's a good omen. So in 2010, we're celebrating the city's 1000th birthday. It's going to be a huge celebration. My name is Ha, which means river, and we are in Hanoi, which literally means a city on the river. Vietnam has become the world's second largest coffee producer after Brazil. And Hanoi, once the capital of French Indochina, has transformed the French coffee culture into a distinctly Asian experience. Pham Ha takes us on a caffeine buzz tour of Hanoi's busy streets via its many coffee houses. Vietnam was one of many French colonies, so you can see the French influence all over the country, and especially in Hanoi. We have lovely French bread, and besides bread, we got delicious coffee. I love coffee. I love it. <laughs> coffee in Vietnam is grown mostly in Central Highland, Buôn Ma Thuot, Pleiku, Dalat, and these beans come from Buôn Ma Thuot. After the roasting process, he pour the hot coffee beans into bamboo baskets like this. He do it in front of the fan, so that's how they separate the hearts and the beans. When he put the beans inside the roaster, the color is light yellow, but after they cook, the color turns a beautiful, rich, dark brown. The taste is uh, crunchy, warm. I don't think it's that bitter, actually. <laughs> bitter sweet. <laughs> Beautiful. The most popular means of transport in Hanoi is the motorbike. The traffic is like, what is the word? Uh, organized chaos. Organized chaos? Yeah. For Asia in general, tea is still more popular, but coffee is becoming more and more popular, definitely. Generally, Vietnamese think that Western coffee is too weak. Vietnamese coffee will give you a stronger kick. Making coffee is like a whole art. How you prepare the coffee beans and make sure it's not over extracted or under extracted. So when she pour the water in, they go through the filter, and this is what comes out. Pure coffee, very, very strong. It's beautiful. It's just beautiful. 
Chị ơi cho cho em một cà phê sữa đá. The most common coffee is cà phê sữa đá sữa means milk referring to thick and creamy sweet and condensed milk. And đá means ice. This is Vietnamese coffee. Just stir it up and the milk sticks to the bottom. Very rich, very creamy. Yummy. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> The Vietnamese, if you gave them a glass of fresh milk like Western people normally drink, they would say, oh, you know, I don't like that. But when, when they turn it into condensed milk, it makes it more sweet, then the Vietnamese like it better. We are now in the old quarter of Hanoi, in a famous little coffee shop, Zang. Ah, this gentleman's father first opened this cafe in 1945. That's his father. This young boy in this picture is the current owner. This family is famous for egg coffee. In Vietnamese, we call cafe trứng, and trứng means egg. It's actually very simple. They crack the egg, and then they have to separate the egg yolk and the egg white. And then they beat the egg yolk with sugar till it get very frothy. They pour the mixture into a small cup like this, and then pour about 15 milliliters of strong coffee on top. Well, it's very rich. Actually, it's like coffee flavor tiramisu, just without the masala wine in it. I'm gonna tell you how to cross the street in Hanoi. Close your eyes and go. Weasel coffee. There's a legend. The weasel, they love to eat coffee fruit. So the weasel, after they ate that in their droppings, you can find the coffee beans. And the farmers, they reckon that that's the best coffee beans. That's the story, but I don't know if there's any truth in it, but it sounds good to me. <laughs> in Vietnamese, we call weasel coffee cà phê chôn, and literally it means coffee weasel. She tried to stir up a frog. The taste is uh, even stronger than the normal coffee. Oh, it's good. The taste more bitter, but it's got a sweet aftertaste. This is my way of drinking coffee. <laughs> I like drinking it that this way. I don't know why, but it's like a like a coffee soup. <laughs> when the French came in the mid 19th century, they introduced coffee to Vietnam. But the way we prepare it, the way we drink it, is different. So we took the French coffee and Vietnamize it <laughs> and make it our own. Tainings province has been making rice paper since the beginning of the 20th century. The family has lived in Tainings for three generations, since the time of the eldest person's grandfather. In Vietnam, rice paper is a staple. But here in Tay Ninh, 55 miles northwest of Ho Chi Minh City, they make a local version that gets its unique softness from lying out in the grassy dew. So special is this particular bon trong, as they call it, that cooks visit from all over the country just to bring it home to their kitchens. She said, we start simply with the rice. She grind it to get really, really nice flour, and then mix it in the water. Mrs. Nam should use a ladle and pour a nice mixture of rice flour and water on top of the cheesecloth. First layer, she will let it stand there for about five seconds and then use the ladle again to pour the second layer on top of already steamed first layer. Mrs. Nam gently 
roll the rice papers on the homemade rolling pin made of bamboo. Mrs. Nam grew up with the rice paper, started making rice paper since she was very young. As the village people can remember, she's been doing it for at least 35 years now. One day, she's like, I'm going to do that during the really nice sunshine weather she'll dry it on the sun for about one to two hours. When the rice paper get dried, they'll grill them. Flipping is quite important because it actually keeps the shape you're waiting for it to go from translucent to white. When it's white, it's done. The most important feature that makes this rice paper unique is after grilling, what the family does is spread them evenly on the net place just above the grass, you'll absorb the evening too and the smell of the grass itself. Depending on the weather, if the weather is really nice and moist, 10 minutes and it's ready. This is what a grilled rice paper looks like before it absorbs the humidity. You hear the sound? And this is the final product. Fold it up nicely because of the morning dew and the evening dew. Nice and soft. Mm. Yummy. <laughs> Ho Chi Minh City is the biggest city in Vietnam. Before the American War, it was called Saigon. Our leader Ho Chi Minh, before he died in 1969, he had one wish that Saigon would be liberated. The war ended in 1975, and the people of Vietnam renamed Saigon Ho Chi Minh City in his honor. We're here at Rex Royal Court Restaurant in the famous Rex Hotel in the middle of Saigon. Like Hanoi in the north, Ho Chi Minh City in the south offers authentic cuisine for many of the country's provinces. One such cuisine is that of the Royal Court of Wei, established during the Win Dynasty in the central part of the country. Imperial cuisine is often represented as lavish dishes made from peacocks or phoenixes. But the truth is, royal cookery requires skilled and careful presentation, not ostentation. At the Rex Hotel, Executive Chef Tron makes the Imperial Fish Roll, which she learned from one of the last remaining royal chefs of Wei. Plainly, royal cuisine means the forbidden food serves in imperial palace for the king. Normal people wouldn't be allowed to eat or cook that kind of food. We started off with fresh water catfish, skinless, has to be skinless. Royal cuisine has to be beautiful. It has to be eaten not only with your mouth, but also with your eyes, with your heart. Fish has to be cut in a thin form to be wrapped more easily. And we're starting with the marinating the fish. Try to mix it gently so we don't crush the fish. We'll start wrapping the fish now. It's a traditional Vietnamese rice paper. The royal court cuisine dates back to the Nguyen dynasty. 1802 to 1945, the Nguyen dynasty decided to establish a capital city in Hue, right in the middle of Vietnam. They were French ruled. Till Ho Chi Minh organized a whole democratic election in the country and started to wage war against French. That's when Nguyen dynasty came to an end. During the process of on-the-job training as a professional cook, she started traveling to Hue in search of imperial palace chefs. 
During that process, she actually found a female cook that used to cook and serve for the queen. That's how she learned how to cook her food straight from that lady. That lady is about 90 years old now. Okay, so basically you just eat it plain like that. What you see on the plate, you have it like that. No dips, no sauce, no nothing. Pure imperial cuisine. <laughs> as it's been marinated with garlic, a bit salty, a little bit sweet, and it's really crispy. You can feel it in your mouth. <laughs> and now the recipe for the royal imperial cuisine is not secretive anymore. It's been passed around to the population and everybody can eat it. In Vietnam, there is a story that has been passed down from generation to generation about King Hung the 17th. He was growing old and worried and wanted to pass his kingdom on to one of his many sons. So to each of them he said, Go and find me something to enjoy and the son who pleases me the most will win my crown. Of course, the sons came home with gold and jewels and artifacts from foreign lands and the king was impressed. But his youngest son, Ling Lang, surprised him. In his hand was a simple square rice cake wrapped in a banana leaf and stuffed with pork and beans. What is this? demanded the king. Father, it is our land from which grows our rice our trees from which spring leaves, our animals and our agriculture stuff within. This cake, which the sun called Bánh Trưng, is Vietnam. It is who we are. And the king was so taken by the simplicity of it all, he rewarded his crown to his youngest son.